Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is John Morgan. I'm the marketing manager here at TMC, and I wanna thank you for joining us today for our webinar on vibration control for semiconductor facilities and equipment. Um, just a couple ground rules. Um, the participants are muted, but we definitely want your questions. So if you have questions, please type them in uh, to the panel on the right where it says questions. We'll leave time at the end to address your questions. Um, and we will also send out a link to the recorded version of the webinar um, after uh, this is all over. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mike Georgialis, who is our North American sales manager. Thanks, John. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We at TMC, we're the world leader in vibration control for ultra precision and sensitive equipment. We cover a lot of different application areas. So I'll touch on that a little bit in a later slide, but today we'll focus on vibration control for semiconductor facilities and equipment. We're gonna start by talking a little bit about trends in semiconductor manufacturing, and then we'll touch upon vibration sensitive instruments. So we'll talk a little bit about the types of instruments we're talking about here uh, when we talk about vibration sensitivity in semiconductor manufacturing. I wanna give a brief overview of isolators and we'll talk about passive isolation systems because those are gonna be important because they're the basis for a lot of the isolation systems that are built in to many of the tools that we're gonna be considering in today's presentation. And then we're gonna spend a fair amount of time discussing active cancellation systems and, and focus on active vibration control because this is where the industry is heading and it's been there in some respects for a long time where active vibration cancellation system has been used for a number of applications. And these applications I'll call use cases. And parallel type and serial type are the types of active cancellation systems we'll be learning about today but I think it's important that we make a distinction between floor vibration control, where you're, think, where you're talking about the facility vibrating and the building and the subfloor all having their own vibration that's due to external causes and things like that, um, versus motion control, which is going to be primarily focused on noise generated by the tool itself, specifically stage motion. And uh, we see a very, very aggressive stage motion as wafers are moved in and out and around uh, and inside tools to do things like stepping and scanning uh, inside, inside semiconductor tools. We're gonna talk about combining systems because we are dealing with uh, uh, systems that are going to need multiple levels of, of vibration control. And we'll talk a little bit about what are the ramifications of combining systems and how do we do it properly. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll cover planning for floor vibration control because uh, we're seeing quite a lot of new fabs starting to be planned here in the next couple of years. And it's important that we talk about how to plan for vibration in fabs. So trends, I had mentioned before, we're, we're seeing, we, we're in a, we're in a global semiconductor shortage and we're seeing a lot of investment by the world's biggest semiconductor manufacturing companies folks like TSMC and Samsung and Intel and SK Hynix, Global Foundries, you know, the biggest semiconductor manufacturers in the world, they're all gonna start pouring money and their governments of the countries that they, that they reside in are gonna start pouring money into advancing semiconductor manufacturing. So that's actually, very exciting. We're going to be seeing quite a bit of activity in semiconductor, and we're starting to see a lot of that even nowadays with extremely high levels of CapEx spending. But at the but at the base level, one trend that's always existed or has existed, you know, since the 50s is Moore's Law from Gordon Moore, where back in the 50s and 60s, when he founded IBM, he said, well, we're going to double the number of transistors on a semiconductor every year. And that's pretty much what we've been seeing. It's been pretty cool from a couple hundred nanom a couple hundred microns to several microns to 
tens of nanometers in the 2000s to now single nanometer nodes, three nanometers, five nanometers. And we're, we're driving this, this, so as we get smaller and smaller in node sizes, we are driving this constant need for higher resolution metrology and imaging. And on the other end of things, we're seeing automated semiconductor tools needing to get faster and faster. So you wanna increase your throughput. throughput. And the best way to increase your throughput is speed up your scanning, speed up your stepping, speed up your wafer transfer, this kind of thing. And as you go faster and faster inside the tools and move your stages that are that are shit that are scanning and stepping your your wafers over and over again, you're going to start to increase those stage forces and vibrate the tool more. So again, vibration becomes more and more of a problem. Not only is it a problem for the imaging and, 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 and metrology methods, but it's also problems for setting time and getting the tools to um, you know, provide faster throughput. Over on the right-hand side is a really interesting image. This is uh, an older image. Look, these are only four, these are 45 nanometer no nodes. And so this is like 20 years ago that these images were taken at about uh, in Cimatec, which, uh, which was in, in, down in Texas. And they had a lithography tool and they were doing this lithography test pattern. And at the top, the top image shows how bad it was with the floor vibration they had there. And this was a floor vibration issue. They took this lithography test pattern, they looked at it under a scanning electron microscope and they took this image at the top. And after a couple tries of trying different, different cancellation methods, they finally settled on an active serial type piezoelectric cancellation system. And they got the test pattern on the bottom. So this was 45 nanometers 20 years ago. Imagine how much harder it is now to get the, the how much more sensitive, now that we're talking about five and three nanometer nodes, how much more sensitive the instruments and the resolution needs to be. It's a factor of 10 times more sensitivity to floor vibration. So what kind of vibration sensitives are, are we talking about? Well, these are, expensive instruments. They're critical investments for every any semiconductor fab. And you know, there's quite a lot of different applications we deal with here at TMC, but I've kind of highlighted some of the ones that we see often in the semiconductor fields. We're talking about scanning electron microscopes, TEMs, and FIBs. So these are your vertical SEMs that are in your failure analysis labs. Um, these are the um, wafer TEM prep tools, the, 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 the types of the, 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 tool, the automated instruments like the uh, Thermo Fisher Helios and those types of instruments that are preparing wafers for failure analysis. Uh, the e beam lithography. So, when you're doing e beam lithography, some of the Wraith tools and the Vistec tool, well, Vistec is Wraith now. Um, transmission electron microscopy, of course, you've got uh, the, the, the 200 and 300 kilovolt TEMs looking at failures and uh, failure modes and things like that. Uh, we do. A, we see a lot of wafer inspection and surface metrology, so interferometry, uh, atomic force microscopy, those types of instruments that are doing wafer incoming wafer inspection. That's a really that's a very high sensitivity high sensitivity process. Um, on the back end, we're seeing things like uh, back end typically hasn't been um, a, a very very highly uh, vibration sensitive field, but um, you know, when you're doing things like dicing and wire bonding and packaging, that's uh, that's actually some things that we're starting to see. Most of these instruments have pretty loose specs. Some of them don't have specs at all, but we're starting to see more and more interest in the um, in the packaging and the back end type uh, type uh, processes. So you know, the front end we're talking, we're looking at uh, the, the the lithography, uh, mask repair, any mask shop type tools. A lot of that stuff's going on. Uh, wafer inspection, failure analysis, defect review and prepare, CD SEM. CD SEM is really big uh, for, for, for vibration control. And on the back end, we're, we're, we haven't seen much in previous generations, but now um, we're starting to see inquiries for, for some back end tools, which is interesting. And so the manufacturers of these instruments, they know that vibration is a problem and they try their best to put isolation inside these systems. And when we talk about an isolator, the first base concept you want to think about is it's really just a spring. 
it's a filter and it's going to filter frequencies from the floor, the payload. And any spring is going to provide an isolation factor, also called a transfer function. function. You can also call it a transmissibility function. And what we're looking at is a ratio of the payload motion to the floor motion. So it's basically an in-out ratio. And it doesn't matter if you're a passive spring or an air spring or a rubber mount or an active isolation system, your, your key characteristic, what everyone cares about is your, is your transfer function. And the way to, the way to work about, the, and um, what you see with, with, with isolators is you always have some sort of compromise. You can always get, uh, there's always going to be some amplification um, within the system. Some systems have higher amplifications at different frequencies than others. And, uh, and to, to, to get rid of that isolate, uh, amplification, you need to trade off performance at different frequencies. So on the right-hand side is a, is, a, is a graph, and it's a very, very basic graph, but it's a really good example of the kind of trade-offs you always deal with when you're talking about isolation systems. And uh, it's, a, it's a standard mass, mass spring, damped mass spring system. And we have your frequency on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you have uh, uh, the relative transfer function. And the, that's the transfer function, I should say. And in the center here is unity. So anything above unity is considered amplification. Anything below unity is considered isolation. And a standard mass, damped mass spring isolation system is going to have a resonant frequency uh, if it's a soft system around you know one hertz between one and two hertz. It's a very very common frequency for a very soft like air isolation system. And if you leave that system undamped, you're going to have a very very high resonance, but you're going to see a, uh, you're going to see a roll off uh, of, of isolation at, that's very quick at higher frequencies. When you increase your damping, your factor, your damping factor is Q. And when you increase, when you, I should say, decrease that damping factor, um, you get more, you put, you, you put some sort of resistance into the system to try to damp out the resonance. And that's usually, that could be like a damping fluid or some sort of mechanical friction, something that provides friction in the system that doesn't transmit everything, but kind of slows down the resonance. And you get this damping of the resonant curve. And that damp, then that resonant curve can be more and more and more damp. But as you damp your, your, your resonance more and more and more, you, get, um, you start to get less and less performance at higher frequencies. And this is for passive systems. And it's important to keep this in mind because passive isolators, which I'll go to next, are basically this design. And the important thing to think about is this is the basis for isolation for pretty much all of the instruments that, um, that, that go into a semiconductor factory. Almost all of these tools have passive air isolators in them. And the purpose of these passive air isolators is, on one hand, to provide really good high frequency isolation. And, um, and in many tools, they're also the load bearing component of the active vibration cancellation system, which I'll, which I'll start talking about next. Now these passive isolators, they function just like a mass on spring and they always have a two hertz resonance uh, or they're typically gonna have a two hertz resonance. And a good example of a two hertz resonance is your, your car springs. You know, if you were to take your car spring out of the car and you get this large spring, you would be able to do anything with it. And it actually would be pretty stiff, a pretty high resonant spring. But once you load it, and uh, when you load a spring, its resonant frequency gets lower and lower and lower. Once you put a two-ton two -ton car on it, uh, it gets to this point where it's pretty soft. Then you can press on your bumper of your car and drive your car roughly two hertz. It won't resonate up and down and continue doing that forever, because it's going to be highly damped. You have, you have the shock in there providing the damping. Um, but, uh, but just as a physical example, two hertz is a very, very common soft spring that we see a lot. Um, these are sealed air chambers. So they're gonna be susceptible to changes in pressure variations. Uh, this is a, the, its basic construction is a sealed air chamber with a cup that holds a piston. And that piston kind of rests in that cup and floats on this air chamber. So you get pressure variations due to the ideal gas law. 
and you can even have some temperature air variations. But most of these types of things aren't problems in semiconductor factories where you're in clean rooms all the time. It's not like somebody's gonna all of a sudden open a door and um, change the pressure in the room enough that it sh causes the isolators to expand or contract. Um, that's not gonna happen in a fab. But what is gonna happen in a fab is you're gonna have, you could potentially have low frequency floor vibration, which is a common building resonance. And because these systems also have low frequency vibration, you could find uh, out, of, out of spec conditions for your tool because they're amplifying what's in the floor. So when we start talking about vibration control uh, and you know the passive isolators may not always provide adequate vibration control or they might be too soft, as I'll talk about later, to really provide effective damping on uh, on state on something like a stage motion. Uh, we start talking about active vibration cancel isolation systems. And when we talk about active systems, we have to say that there's usually three components in an active system. You want to have a motion sensor, you want to have a force actuator, and you need some sort of control loop. Now, there's two types of active cancellation systems. When you start taking these components, the motion sensors and the force actuators and these control loops, you can kind of configure them in different architectures, which I'll talk about in the next in the coming slides. But at a high level, you have your serial type, your serial type active cancellation systems, which have a feedback loop. Their actuators are typically piezoelectrics, and they you employ stiff springs. We have a serial type system. It's called the, the stasis piezoelectric actuation system. We have a, then you have your parallel type systems. Again, you've got your feedback loop, which I'll talk about later, and then you've got linear motors, which provide the cancellation force. Sometimes you use festo valves, so you can use pneumatic control also by varying the pressure uh, in the, of the isolators. You can actually provide enough force to provide some, some, some vibration control. And they're soft springs, so it's usually an air spring or a soft metallic die spring, something like that. Now, parallel type systems, they work really well. You can add vibrational feed forward, you can add command feed forward. And um, just as a note, you know, um, Parallel type uh, is offered by basically every company in the world for floor vibration control, uh, but serial type is, is unique to TMC for floor vibration control. But as I'll talk about in later slides, there's reasons why you want to use serial type for floor vibration control and why it might not be suitable for motion control and vice versa. You want to use parallel type mostly for motion control, like stage motion control, but it might not be suitable for floor vibration control. Here's a parallel type system. And the aspect of the slide I'd like to focus on most is the, uh, the free body diagram here on the right. Now, this is a one dimensional free, di free body diagram, but all these systems are designed to be, uh, should be considered at least three degree of freedom systems. Uh, at and at best, you know, you want to have six degrees of freedom. But in this one degree of freedom, uh, three, free body diagram, we're looking at a parallel type system. And a parallel type system simply consists of a mass. We'll consider this your, your isolated payload. This might be a platform top uh, for, a, for a pedestal in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a facility, or more often it would be a, a, a granite, maybe a granite table, uh, which holds the moving stage inside an instrument like a CD SEM or a mass inspection tool or something like that, or an AFM. And on your isolated payload, this is where you have your sensor. And then your sensor is gonna send a signal to your force actuators. This being a parallel type system, your force actuators won't be load bearing. They'll be, let's say they're linear motors this time. The mass of the load is gonna be borne by the spring here. So this could be a air spring or a die spring. But either way, your spring is here bearing the load of the system and your actuator is doing really nothing more than providing a, providing a force that's equal and opposite to whatever it's being uh, sensed by the sensor here. So this type of system actually works really, really well if you have noise on the payload that you know uh, that that's known and predictable. Because not only can you have the sensor sending a relatively predictable signal to the actuators uh, to cancel it out, 
You can also add in feed forward relatively easily. So say you have a moving stage and you know the acceleration and mass of that stage and you know how fast you want uh, to get to a point where the system is settled so you can get to a, um, get to a, a, a place where you can do your measurement. It's really easy to add feed forward into these types of systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about settling time later. But one of the main disadvantages of these systems is that they're soft spring based. And the soft spring, as I mentioned before, is always gonna have a two hertz resonance or somewhere in that low frequency range. So if you picture a vibration coming up from the earth and going into the payload, then that vibration at two hertz is gonna be sensed by the sensor and it's gonna to wanna to cancel it out. That's fine. But we're talking about amplified vibration at low frequency. In addition to that amplified vibration at low frequency, we're also getting in all of the other inputs from the system. So you've got acoustics on the payload, you've got the payload's own motion, maybe you've got some user motion on the payload. Uh, you've got, uh, and, and, and at the same time, uh, so you're trying to cancel, so the system doesn't know what to cancel. It's getting fed a lot of information, resonance from its own springs and all the payload no information. So you start to encounter bandwidth limitations and you start to, uh, start to encounter um, limitations to how well the system can perform. And this starts to get you to a place where, well, you're always kind of grappling with stability. If you want to get good floor vibration cancellation, you can increase your gains, you can make the system more and more sensitive, but there's so much input from the floor and there's a lot of input from the sensor as well that the system doesn't know what it's trying to cancel. Is it trying to cancel the floor? Is it trying to cancel the ground? So instability is always a concern with parallel type systems. However, if you're not considering floor vibration, if you're not trying to cancel floor vibration, you can ignore that two hertz resonance and just try to cancel out known motion on the payload, like stage motion. And so these work very, very, very well for, um, for stage motion cancellation, but they're always at risk of instability when you're trying to do floor vibration cancellation. And this results in oftentimes they need to be retuned. They can go on oscillation modes very, very quickly. Uh, and if you really want it to be a reliable floor vibration cancellation system, you're probably gonna have to crank down the gains quite a bit and actually live with pretty subpar performance. And I'll look at an example of that later too. On the other end of things, we have serial type cancellation systems. And a serial type of cancellation system takes those same three components, a, 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 a force actuator, a control loop, and a motion sensor, and they're arranged in a different way, in a different architecture. And the architecture that we see with the serial type system is a, uh, it uh, has the pay isolated payload, but there's a second uh, supported by an inner mass, or I'm sorry, supported by a spring. Now this spring in a serial type system is gonna be a stiff spring. We're gonna be looking at resonant frequencies around 15 to maybe 20 Hertz, depending on the payload. So it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a stiff piece of rubber. And you have a third component that we have here called the inner mass, which is a very, very high frequency machine structure, usually in the, in the frequencies of thousands of Hertz. And it's on the inner mass that we place the sensor. And that sensor has your feedback control loop. And then your force actuators are actually acting on your inner mass. In this case, the force actuators are load bearing. And that's a, key that's a key differentiator with the serial type system is that you've got a load bearing force actuator and really the only material in the world that can really be an effective load bearing force actuator is a piezoelectric stack. So we have piezoelectrics here supporting the inner mass and bearing the entire load of the system. And the, the very high level takeaway is that this entire system uses no soft components. Piezoelectrics have very, very high resonant frequencies. Um, the, the, the spring that supports the payload has a very, very high resonant frequency in the relatively high. And, the, and therefore, there's really no low frequency resonances feeding into the system, which gives you quite a lot of bandwidth available for broadband cancellation, especially at low frequencies where you don't have this, this uh, superfluous input. input. And what we can achieve with serial type cancellation systems is much, much better floor vibration cancellation and much, much better stability 
uh, at low frequencies. So, um, but what we can't achieve with a serial type cancellation system is payload cancellation. So if you have aggressive payload motion and you're trying to achieve better and better settling times, then it's got no mechanism for uh, either feedback or feed forward from the payload. And furthermore, it has no mechanism to act against it. So if there's very, very uh, aggressive payload motion, there's no active component here that's able to cancel it out in any way because all of that payload motion is sent is filtered out by this spring. So the sensor sees only the difference between payload, of the, only the transfer function of the spring, um, uh, you know, the, the payload motion multiplied by the transfer function of the spring is the only input that you're gonna see at the sensor here, which is gonna be very, very low. And it's not gonna be able, and even if you actuate a force against it, that force needs to go back up through the inner mass, through this isolating spring to the payload. So there's no payload motion control that is afforded to you by a serial type cancellation system. It's an advantage because it frees up a lot of bandwidth for excellent floor vibration cancellation, but it makes it not suitable for applications where you need to do more payload cancellation. Here's the difference in transmissibility that you see between a serial type and a, can and, and a, and a parallel type system. This is similar to the transmissibility plot that we saw before, where you have unity and everything above unity is amplification and everything below unity is isolation. Your blue curve, the blue curve here shows an example serial type curve. You can see one hertz here, we're already getting roughly 50% isolation. If I have hit two hertz, we're hitting 90% isolation. So really good isolation at low frequencies and broadband also very good isolation. At higher frequencies, they kind of even out. But in either case, higher frequencies isn't as much of a concern for the instruments that we're talking about because most of them already have their own internal soft air isolators, which are already providing high levels of high frequency isolation. So the resonant frequency is very, very low also in a serial type system. And this is a characteristic of the uh, uh, of, of, uh, of the feedback control electronic loops. It actually is not a mechanical resonance, unlike the parallel type systems, which have a mechanical resonance that you're always trying to suppress uh, uh, due to the nature of its own system. And you can see the parallel curve uh, isn't gonna hit 50% isolation until you know, roughly three or four Hertz. And it's not gonna hit 90% isolation until, until, until very, very to higher frequencies. So if you really wanna get that lower frequency isolation and really take out those uh, those resonant frequencies from your building floor that are going to be causing problems for your instruments that are gonna have their own low frequency sensitivities due to the passive isolators inside, the serial type system is really the correct choice. Here's an example. Now we're gonna move into the use cases. <clears throat> The use cases, uh, we're going to talk about parallel type versus uh, serial type floor vibration cancellation. And then we'll talk about serial type active floor vibration cancellation. And then we'll talk about using either system for motion control. So here's a good example of a vertical SEM. So it's a standalone uh, SEM fib tool, similar to like a, um, like a Helios from Thermo Fisher or um, one of the Joel SEM SEMFIBs or a cross beam from Zeiss, something like that. And when we go out there and we turn to, uh, put, a, put a system underneath a tool like that, we take measurements. And here's was one that was uh, installed initially on a parallel type active floor vibration cancellation system, not made by TMC. And when you look at these graphs, we're looking at one third octave frequency on the X axis and then magnitude in meters per second on the left axis, on the y axis here. The red curve shows the measurement of the floor. The green curve shows the measurement of the floor on, on top of the, the floating column. So remember, these instruments have their own internal air isolators that are floating. Uh, and, the, um, and then the blue curve shows the measurement at the top of the system. So what we see here is we see a red uh, of frequencies in the floor that are roughly 25 to 60 hertz high frequency problems. And we take a measurement on top of the parallel system. So the parallel system 
we start getting into two hertz, you're starting to see a little, you know, some performance here. So somehow they highly tuned this system to get some performance at two hertz, and apparently it was stable. You know, they they sacrificed a little performance at four hertz, but then you start to see what you expect: really, really good performance at higher frequencies. So you know, trouble at low frequencies, but good performance at high frequencies. Very indicative of a of a parallel type system. Uh, when you take a measurement on the column, you see something that uh, uh, that shows a little bit about the tool's own internal resonances. You have really not too much resonances, sort of rigid body motion in the column uh, up to about eight hertz, but then you see a vertical resonance around 12 and a half hertz. So what this is showing here is a reduction of the floor vibration in the 10 to 20 hertz frequency range to these levels, but then a reamplification of the floor vibration due to the tool's own internal structures coming back up. And then those are, those are structures that are gonna have their own transfer functions. And you'll see really, really good cancellation at higher frequencies of the tool's own internal isolators. Horizontally is a little bit of a different story. Uh, you see here, we have the floor measurement horizontally. The parallel type system was actually amplifying horizontally. So this was actually more to be expected. So what this tells me is that this, this parallel type system, it was stiffer vertically than it was horizontally. You can imagine it was probably a spring-based system. So when you're pressing down on a spring, it's a lot easier than it is to bend a spring. Uh, I'm sorry, it's harder to press a spring than it is to bend a spring. So you got a softer spring horizontally. And that's what's gonna give you these resonances at low frequencies. So it's actually amplifying the floor vibration at these, at these low frequencies. Uh, and then you're seeing further amplification by the tool's own internal isolators. So this was causing problems for, these, for this uh, electron microscope. And uh, to solve that, it was put on a serial type cancellation system. And here we saw really, really good results that are exactly indicative of what we would expect. Uh, from a from a, from a floor by, from a horizontal from a floor vibration cancellation system, uh, that's a serial type active piezo type. You see the floor vibration here. At low frequencies, you've got the blue curve, which is our uh, the, the amount was measured on top of the blue system. Very very good at low frequencies. And then the green curve again shows um, it shows you know rather rigid body motion. No amplification really in this case because of the probably because the floor input was so low, uh, and then further further uh, um, reduction uh, from the floating column passive isolators. We see the same story horizontally here, where you've got some green uh, some uh, red curve here, which is the floor. Here's the horizontal um, here's the horizontal uh, uh, amp resonance of the tools on internal isolators. And then again, but the, again, very good reduction of the floor vibration using the, the using the serial type system. Sometimes people ask questions about these graphs at higher frequencies, once you get to 31 uh, to 60 and 125 Hertz, and you start to say, well, why is the floor data relatively you know, uh, indistinguishable from the data on top of the cancellation system? But the column data is much, much lower. Well, the reason for that is, Remember, the serial type system is not trying to cancel anything on the payload. So when you put an independent sensor on the payload, that independent sensor is going to pick up all of the payload resonances, which aren't being canceled by the system. And all those resonances are typically going to be high frequency. They're going to be acoustic coupling into the payload from the room. They might be pumps and motors and all sorts of things. So it becomes very difficult to measure at the top of a serial system what you're doing at higher frequencies. But you don't really care because the floating column of the instrument itself is gonna be a passive isolator with excellent high frequency cancellation. And it's gonna go ahead and cancel all that superfluous noise out. So um, that's a, and, and, and here's, so that concludes a really good example of, you know, the performance that's achievable with parallel type systems for floor vibration cancellation versus serial type uh, systems in, um, in, motion, in, in floor vibration cancellation. So let's talk a little bit about motion control. In motion control, we've got uh, what we're trying to do in, a, in, in most cases is cancellation of a moving stage, a stage that's going to step or scan a wafer uh, to go through some you know, operation, be it, uh, be it uh, scanning an electron microscope or uh, looking for defects or anything like, or lithography operation, anything like that. And 
when we're looking at a graph like this, we want to talk about sudden in time. That's really what we care about. We want that stage to move to get where it needs to be as fast as it can get there, and we want to and when it's and we want to stop it as fast as we can. And when we stop it as fast as we can, the whole tool is going to vibrate from that motion. So we want to cancel out that tool vibration from that moving stage. And here's a really good example of a parallel type system providing um, providing different levels of cancellation. We have time on the x-axis and a relative displacement on the left axis. And what we want to look at first is the stage motion profile. So this is the motion profile that's a that's a that's a um that's a reference curve, and it's a stage moving. So here's the stage accelerating. Uh, you know, this being a graph of position versus time, we have a uh, constant acceleration here, and then moving at a constant velocity for some period, and then uh, oh, and then uh, accelerating down, and then um, accelerating back, and then finally coming still. And what we have here is the next thing we have is uh, the relative motion of a point on the payload due to the effect. And so here you have the, uh, the, the, the displacement increasing very quickly. So this is an undamped uh, system. So this is a, this is a basic, a basic parallel type system based off of a pneumatic isolator. And so if you just have a pneumatic isolator, you get a very high displacement relative to that, to that stage motion. And it starts to oscillate back and forth. And eventually, it starts to stand still by means of its own friction. But if you uh, and and this you know this this low di low displacement here uh, is where is is where you know the stage is no longer moving anymore. So I should actually say I'm sorry. This is constant velocity moving up, and then stage stands still. Constant velocity moving down. Stage stands still. So the flat line is the stage finally standing still. So the goal is a straight line. Get get this motion to be a straight line as fast as possible. And when I add voice coil motors or linear motors to, the, to try to cancel out that, I get much faster cancellation where uh, I'm anticipating the motion of the stage. And I'm starting to apply forces to cancel it out, uh, in con to cancel it out. And what I see is a much less oscillation and coming to a flat line much, much faster. So we have a roughly a 0.4 seconds settling time here. Uh, sorry, 0.2 seconds settling time versus a much longer settling time, roughly the difference between 0.5 and 0.8 seconds here. So, you know, 50% increase in settling time here at least with much, much less, dis much, much lower displacements uh, due to the use of this parallel type system and linear motors. Now, serial type motion control, as I mentioned in a serial, in a, in a previous slide, it doesn't really exist. You know, uh, it's not really built into a serial type system. So, uh, but it can be by putting, by turning it into sort of like a quasi parallel type system. And what you've got to do to achieve serial type motion control is, as I mentioned before, there's no internal actuator that can effectively apply a load to apply a force to the payload. So you've got to put a force in parallel to that system. So you have a feed forward signal coming in and you can provide, and you can, and then you can have that separate feedback loop or feed forward loop with a separate actuator acting on the payload. And you can achieve very, very aggressive settling times with that. And here's an example, similar to, uh, similar to the example I spoke, to, spoke about before where you have a stage motion profile uh, moving with a constant velocity, holding still, moving down, and then moving again. So this is two stage motions. And here you have the example of a system without any sort of voice coil motor in parallel in the system. So this is, this is representative of the settling time that could be achieved with just that passive rubber mount on top of the intermass. And you can see that it oscillates for some time and eventually comes down in about 800 milliseconds. You know, you come to a, uh, come to a, a point where you have no notable motion. Well, well, if you put this voice coil motor in parallel with that system, you now have uh, you now can feed forward a signal and start to anticipate the force that you're going to need to be to slow down that motion quickly, and you can bring that settling down to 200 milliseconds. 
And setting the time, as I mentioned before, is, is very important because that's directly proportionate to your throughput. The more, the faster you can settle, the more wafers you can profit, process, and the more wafers you can put through a tool at any given time. So systems can be combined, and uh, this is something we do all the time because you have all of the companies that are making all these automated semiconductor tools like a Applied Materials and Hitachi and Thermo Fisher, and they're all got their own internal isolation systems. And a lot of those internal isolation and ASML, and a lot of those internal isolation systems are active isolation systems, and a lot of them are passive isolation systems. So the question becomes, well, my tool's got its own internal isolation system. Is it possible for me to put it on another active isolation cancellation as active system? Uh, and the answer is yes, but you've got to know what you're doing. You can stack an active system inside a tool on an active system uh, below it on a platform, that's done all the time. You can put a passive system on top of a, um, uh, inside an instrument, on top of an active system, on top on a platform, that's done all the time. And you can put a passive system on top of a passive system. And we're that used to be done all the time, but we're seeing that less and less and less because, uh, because passive systems have at resonances at low frequencies. And if you stack them, there's nothing you can do about it. And the way to do it, you got to achieve one of two uh, two criteria. You either got to have a separation of mass or separation of stiffness. So the answer to separation of mass is something that we've seen for, for many, many years. You use the plinth, the very, very large and heavy concrete block supported by isolators. And on top of that block, you put your, your, your instrument. And that's OK because you'll prevent the coupling of the resonant frequencies of the isolator supporting the block and the isolator inside the tool. You won't get coupling, but you'll still get a summing of the resonant frequencies. So you'll still have extremely high levels of vibration isolation at low frequencies, which might, might be tolerable. But luckily you won't have, um, if, you do, if you make a plinth sufficiently large enough, you won't have a coupling of the systems and get instabilities. Separation of stiffness is the other way to do it, where we use serial type piezoelectric systems where you've got the internal stiff rubber mount and you've got the, uh, you've got the piezoelectric actuators and they're supporting internal tool internal systems which are lower resonant frequencies. I had mentioned before, most of these are air systems. So the stasis system, the uh, piezoelectric serial type systems are designed to be a second stage of isolation system, isolation to support low frequency resonant systems. And that mass in between is no longer critical. You don't need these large, massive blocks to make this work. And we do this. Actually, we have a product that's packaged to do this. Uh, and you can achieve really good vibration cancellation uh, with, uh, at both high frequency and low frequency when you stack systems. You have a, for example, this is an optical table only, but, um, but this is kind of scaled up when you uh, support it. Uh, like, a, like a semiconductor tool with passive isolators inside it supported by stasis. So we have the passive isolation system here, sealed air chamber piston isolators supported by piezoelectric actuators. And you get really, really good transmissibility because you have the summing of the high frequency of the, of, the, of, the, of the passive isolators inside it combined with the low frequency performance of the piezoelectric system beneath it. You can achieve excellent cancellation. We do that all the time when we put a tool on top of a stasis quiet island. And here's an example of a type of product that would be a pedestal inside a facility that actually stacks, that, that's an example of, of excellent system stacking. It's called a quiet island. It's basically a pedestal that goes into a, a semiconductor facility. And it replaces, you guys are all familiar with pedestals and raised floors, I'm sure. But we have a platform top that provides the new floor for the instrument. It's supported by the serial type active isolators. And then underneath there's stiff support structures that, uh, that can deal with you know, different height raised floors and waffle floors and all that kind of thing. And these are really great uh, designs because they have this actively isolated low frequency cancellation. It's compatible with all the tools internal isolators. Like any pedestal, it's got a pedestal top that's designed to, to fit the shape of the tool. So you have reduced potential for mechanical shorts and reduced acoustic accompling into the platform top. You have reduced risk of vibration introduced by users on the platform. Uh, and they're modular systems. So we can make them 
all different sizes and make all sorts of different uh, custom shapes for, uh, for a quiet island. And so for floor vibration cancellation, you really want to go this route because it's going to give you that broadband, low frequency cancellation. Low frequency is very common in fabs. And it's going to be compatible with the tool's internal isolators. And even though it's not actively canceling out what's going on, on, the, on inside the tool, that's not a big deal because it's stiff enough that it doesn't slosh back and forth when there's a stage motion. And that's what this chart here is kind of is trying to explain again into stacking systems. So what you have here is an example of a moving stage is our typical you know stage motion profile. And we modeled here uh, differently damped passive isolators versus a very, very stiff stereo piezo actuator. And you look at the difference in settling times here. You have quite a lot of isolation in an un, in a in a in a lightly damped isolator taking forever to settle after a stage motion where you have much less motion when you add more damping material into that passive isolator. But forget about damping materials and forget about passive low frequency isolators. Let's switch to a high frequency rubber mount passively, you know, high frequency isolator using a rubber mount at a frequency roughly 15 to 20 hertz. You see here, almost unaffected by the stage motion. And that's what you see when you put something on an instrument like this. You see a tool that's moving quite a lot but the platform doesn't move at all. We call it a hard mount system. So when you're planning for vibrate for the floor vibration control, I think one of the most important things to remember is vibration in your facility is always going to rise over time. And this is a this is a chart from a study that was done by Colin Gordon Associates some time ago. And what they did was they went into a fab that was newly built and it was designed to some design criteria, uh, and they took measurements of the floor. They went to the empty fab and they got this red curve, which shows what you would expect in an empty facility. Pretty smooth, resonant frequency roughly around 50 hertz, probably from all the HVAC equipment and stuff like that, and then rolling off again. So you kind of see this resonant frequency of the facility. Well, 16 months or 17 months and 14 months later, they went back in after the fab was all completely populated and we saw increases, especially at low frequencies, of 10 times of what was there initially. So, you know, this is very, very common. You know, you're always seeing more and more vibration in the facilities. So you always got to be prepared for a tool that's installed one day, all of a sudden goes out of spec another day. Well, what do you do with that? You got to put a vibration cancellation system under it, and you got a lot of tool downtime if you got to put a uh, vibration cancellation system in there after the fact. Another problem that we see is we see folks trying to design quiet buildings. Well, quiet buildings aren't really the answer because you can make your slabs as beefy and uh, filled with as much mass and concrete as you possibly can. But it gets more and more expensive and you start to achieve diminishing returns. And the important thing to remember is that your building vibrations won't be less than the earth below it. So if you've got noisy ground from uh, trains and traffic and, and uh, whatever else is going on outside, you can build a map of building as masses as you possibly can, and it still won't be less than the earth below it. And you won't be able to fight the fact that the vibration kind of facilities are, are rising over time. So more and more, uh, we see this, this point of diminishing returns where it might be more smart, more uh, economical to use point of view solutions. You use vibration control where you need it. You don't want to necessarily go uh, and build a super massive building Really, what you can do is you can save on your building costs and build a less massive building and put uh, vibration only vibration control only when you need it, where you'll use active platforms in less expensive buildings. And there's, an, and there's actually an analogous precedent, which I think is a pretty good story. And it has to do with the cleanliness in clean rooms. So when you look at clean room environments, uh, you've uh, over time, things have gotten to get cleaner and cleaner. And nowadays, we're in these whole bunny suits trying to keep human particulates out of the clean room. Well, eventually, the joke was, well, you're going to need to be so clean, you're going to have to wear a, a spacesuit. Well, that's not that practical, and you can only make a clean room so clean because people have to go in there. Well, what they do, they invited, they invented the Smiths and the Foops, your little mini environments, little ultra clean environments that carry wafers from place to place. So you have clear cleanliness where you need it most, um, but not in the entire facility. Well, it's the same for vibration control. Put the vibration control where you need it most. We don't have to put it in the whole facility. So the analogy and the analogy and the punchline is: Why freeze the house? All you want is a cold beer. And here's a 
nice Google image of a delicious frosty glass of beer. So in summary, as technology advances, uh, vibration become increasing an issue. We've seen this with Moore's law. We're seeing this with yield rates, uh, with, 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 um, with throughput rates, I should say. And you can use active vibration cancellation systems to mitigate vibration. And the most important thing to think about is if you're looking at parallel type systems and you want to do stage motion control, parallel type is the way to go. And if you want to do floor vibration cancellation, serial is the way to go. And uh, so, so be on the lookout for that. Is there, and with that, I will conclude my presentation and open it up to any questions. Thanks, Mike, that was great. Um, yeah, I've got a couple questions, again, uh, for the people that are on, that we still have, you know, 10 minutes here, so type in your questions. Um, the uh, the first question I have is, um, it looks like all the platforms you make are custom. Are there limits to the size and shape of these? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we are limited by how big a platform you can put on a truck and how big a platform uh, you, we can build here. So, you know, we, come, we, we, we can build them pretty large. I think our biggest platforms are like 12 feet by like nine feet wide. Um, but what you see with some of the really large like mask inspection tools and things like that, we actually can are able to make, you know, multiple platform systems. So if you need to get bigger and bigger, uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, stay, these, these isolators are all modular. You just put more platforms together and bridge the tool across the platforms. On the other end of things, you can make things smaller and smaller and smaller. So the, the smallest limit is, you know, uh, we, we made platforms small enough for scanning electron microscopes and even smaller tools. So we're very flexible. And raised floor heights, um, you know, we're also very flexible. We've done up to five foot tall raised floor heights. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we can do. So, so really, you know, challenge us and, and then we'll try to see if we can make uh, something that meets your application needs. All right, thanks, Mike. Um... Yeah, so sort of along the same lines, um, when is the best time to start thinking about vibration solutions? Uh, when we're ready to install the machines or when we're building the fab? I think what you want to see is uh, as soon as you can. You know, when you're building the fab, it's it's going to be the story that I was telling earlier. You know, you can probably get much more cost effectiveness by adopting the quiet islands, not quiet buildings philosophy and using vibration cancellation only when you need it. Uh, but if you're planning on bringing a tool in, you want to be getting your surveys done uh, and, and start planning for the different uh, characteristics you might need in a platform that's going to be there to support the tool. So, uh, but what you don't want to happen is you install a tool, find out you have a vibration problem, and then have to decommission it so you can put a platform under it. Okay, thanks. Um, then, uh... I can see how vibration control uh, is very important for front end fab processes, but do we really need this for any of our back end processes? Yeah, you know, we haven't seen a whole lot of back end until recent years. Uh, it all just depends on what the vibration facility, the conditions are at the facility and what the specifications of the tool are. So, you know, they're usually less sensitive tools, the bonders and the, the, the dicers and the packaging tools and things like that. They're usually much less sensitive, but if you're putting them in areas that are high floor vibration, like near a loading dock or uh, near some mechanical shops, you can definitely see uh, some problems with floor vibration, even with these less sensitive tools. So, um, you know, space is limited in the world and people are putting more and more tools in places where they shouldn't go. So yeah, it's possible to see more and more backend uh, type tools. Uh, I, we expect to see more of that here at TMC. Okay, great. Uh, next one, how do you adjust damping in your passive as well as active isolating systems? And what kind of damping do you incorporate? Yeah, that's a good question. So damping is typically done uh, lots of different ways. You can use mechanical damping, but usually the most common way to damp a system is with a, damping, with a viscous damping fluid. So you, you've, you've got a passive isolation canceling, a passive isolation system that's a sealed air chamber. It's got a piston hanging down into that air chamber. You can adjust the viscosity and amount of a fluid in that air chamber to provide more damping. And as I said before, the difference is you can get even lower that resonant frequency and shift it up in frequency a little bit, but you're gonna sacrifice higher frequencies. Active cancellation systems, I really do wanna say they're 
they're necessarily damped. You know, they're, they're, they're providing their own cancellation by means of actuation. Unless you're talking about a parallel type system, in which case you have an air bit, an air isolator, and something like that would be very, very common for you to use some damping fluid inside the air isolator. Okay, great. Um, I have another one here. Any design criteria on the number of isolators per pad, three versus four or more? Typically you see four, uh, but uh, the, the, the limiting factors on isolators are their capacity and their separation from one another because they're gonna have their given load capacity. So you're gonna have to factor in the weight of the platform and the tool, which is gonna give you your first indicator as to how many isolators you need to use. But also you're gonna be looking at their distance from one another, because if you start placing them too far from one another, you've got this platform that they're supporting, supporting that's gonna have its own bending modes. And you don't wanna to be too far because you don't wanna excite or, or risk any of these bending or torsional modes in the platform. So when we design a platform, we consider first the loading on each isolator, and then the distance from uh, one another. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, that seems to be it for uh, questions. So uh, yeah, as Mike said, if any more come up, feel free to contact us directly and uh, we'll be sending out a link to the recorded um, uh, presentation. Great, thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your day.